Good morning to all the participants of this program. Today we are celebrating National Science Day. The National Science Day is celebrated as a science carnival to recognize scientific activities and programs by the participation of students from schools and colleges and the general public. This event provides a real platform for students to guide them for their career in the science profession. The National Technology Day is very significant for CSIR Neri when it comes to understanding various environmental issues which are critically important for human communities, livelihoods, and well-being, as well as for the health and integrity of ecosystems. In this context, this webinar on integrated approach for sustainable environment has been organized to enlighten various issues and possible solutions. Sri P. S. Narayan, Global Head, Sustainability and Social Initiatives, Vipro Limited, Dr. Srinivasan Ramaswamy, Assistant Professor, Center for Sustainable Technologies, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and Dr. Sorup Datta, Assistant Professor, Department of Policy and Management Studies, Terry School of Advanced Studies, New Delhi, have joined us as guest speakers of the webinar. Students and teachers of Kendri Vidyalayas, Navodai Vidyalayas, Tata Parsi Junior College, and other schools, uh, health workers from our Department of uh, uh, Family Welfare and uh, uh, Health, uh, uh, government of Maharashtra are also prominently participating in this program under Jigyas and Vigyan Jyoti schemes of Government of India. Now, may I request our director, Dr. Vatul Vaidya, to deliver welcome address, please. Very good morning to all. On this auspicious day of science, National Science Day, on behalf of CSIMA, I welcome today's eminent speakers, Shri P. S. Narayanji, who is Global Head of Sustainability and Social Initiatives for the Pro Limited, Dr. Engineering uh, Srinivasan Ramaswamy, who is Assistant Professor in IIC Bangalore, the Reputed Institute, Dr. Swarup Datta, who is Assistant Professor in Terry School, uh, Terry School of Advanced Studies, New Delhi. Uh, that way, for an institution like NERI, which is a science dedicated institute, every day should be a science day. But we celebrate this National Science Day to commemorate the invention of Dr. C. V. Raman, that is Raman's, Raman effect, Raman spectrum for which he was awarded Nobel Prize, the first Indian scientific Nobel Prize, which was awarded, in, awarded to him while he was working in India. Today, uh, because COVID third wave is just, just winning, still we are not, uh, there are no directives to have full house here and a complete celebration, open day and all that for uh, kind of, uh, National Day Science uh, celebrations, which we used to have before. We thought of having it in hybrid mode that all our faculty at NERI is online. And we, in this auditorium, uh, we have invited uh, teach some teachers and uh, health workers to commemorate this National Science Day and the talks thereof. I'll briefly touch the aspect of sustainability, what, uh, why integrated sustainable environment is required. Society, environment, and technology. These are the three, or science and technology. These are the three basic pillars of the sustainability. The thing should be technically feasible, thing should be socially acceptable, and thing should be economically it should be environmentally sustainable or environmentally environment friendly and it should be economically viable. And science and technology will not know the bounds. They are bound by rules and regulations. If you use science and technology without any discrimination, if we use it discrimination, without discrimination, so then we are going to deplete our all resources which are not all all are not renewable and our environment will be very bad it, it will not be conducive for 
life form. And therefore, in use of science and technology, our approach should be for sustainable environment. Because if environment is not sustainable, there is no point in having luxury, there is no point in having all the developments. If the environment is not sustainable for our life, and life will be miserable in that case. And therefore, I think today's theme is also related to sustainability, uh, integrated approach, uh, science and uh, technology for sustainable future. And uh, this integrated, today's topic here, integrated approach for sustainable environment is also uh, befitting to that. Uh, quick two words, and then I'll uh, sum up this address, is that there are two thoughts of uh, science uh, development. One is observer is out of science, and second is observer is within, it's very difficult concept. But observer and the phenomenon, if they are different, it, it has developed into a lot of uh, engineering, engineering developments in the world. But uh, with the advent of quantum mechanics in the last decade and present, we cannot separate science from the observer. I, I myself cannot be separated from my thoughts and my environment, and I cannot myself be separated from scientific principles. So all laws and rent, that, that is true with everybody. And therefore, more we think of this, uh, it is more we have, we have to think about sustainability. So modern science will also finally lead to the concept of sustainability, wherein everybody is involved, all the society, all the environment, everything around us is involved. And science and technology is not only for human being, it should be for everybody's uh, welfare, including environment. And this has been the thought over the years in all philosophies, and science is again, again getting back to that. So I hope uh, today's discussions will be very fruitful, very enlightening, and we can take some messages about the sustainability. हम किस तरीके से साइंस और टेक्नोलॉजी का यूज करते हुए हमारे फ्यूचर को और हमारे एनवायरनमेंट को सुरक्षित बना सकते हैं ये इसका टॉपिक रहेगा और इसके लिए जो प्रयास चल रहे हैं कॉर्पोरेट लेवल्स पे प्राइवेट में आर एंड डी लेवल पे रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूशन में इसके बारे में थोड़ी सी चर्चा इस लिमिटेड टाइम में हुई विद दिस आई अगेन वेलकम ऑल ऑफ यू टू दिस वेबिनार to come uh, to celebrate national science science day thank you very much yes it is true that uh, science and technology does not have any limit or discrimination and uh, this modern science now whatever we are taking the interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary approach it should ensure sustainability thanks sir for giving this message now our first speaker is guest speaker is uh, shri ps narayan global head sustainability and social initiative vipro limited it is an honor for me to introduce him shri ps narayan is the global head of sustainability and social initiatives at vipro limited he is also the managing trustee at vipro foundation the social initiatives arm of vipro limited He has been instrumental in the creation of Vipro Sustainability Initiative and has stewarded it since inception in early 2008. Vipro Sustainability Charter is built on the core principle that business and social purpose must reinforce each other in addressing several key challenges around ecology and the environment, education and communities. In addition, Narayan is a visiting faculty at the Azim Premji University where he teaches ecology and development program. He is also a visiting faculty at Xavier School of Sustainability, Xavier University, Bhuneshwar. Sri Narayan also conducts learning sessions regularly on sustainability at IIM Bangalore and IIM Indore. His interests center around the broad interplay between ecology, economics, and humanities, the role of the business sector as a change agent in sustainable development, sustainability in education, and sustainability, uh, sustainable and inclusive cities. Prior to the current role, Sri Narayan was the global head of informative systems for Wipro's IT business when he was chosen as one of the CIOs, Global 25 Ones to Watch. A graduate in electrical engineering with a post-graduation in management, 
Sri Narayan has more than 27 years of cross-disciplinary experience in business development, enterprise systems, and corporate sustainability. He is also involved in sustainability advocacy as a member of several industry forums on sustainability. He is currently the chairman of the CII GPC Green Co Forum for Bangalore. With this brief introduction, um, sir, we are eagerly waiting, uh, waiting and looking forward to your address. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for that um, generous introduction. And uh, I consider it a privilege to have this opportunity to talk to all of you. Uh, thank you, Director. Uh, and thank you, Neri, for this opportunity. Uh, especially so because today is National Science Day commemorating the birthday of the legendary scientist, Dr. C.V. Raman. And especially so because you know, I had the opportunity of uh, talking to so many students from schools and colleges. Of course, one wishes that the setting had been a physical interaction setting that would have made it much more interesting. Uh, but given the circumstances, I think you know this is the best that all of us uh, got used to. Uh, in the 20 minutes uh, you know that i'm going to talk about climate change given that you know most of you are students i'm going to keep it uh, at a fairly high level it'll, it'll be impossible to go into depth into any issue of climate change especially given the fact that climate change as we know is a very uh, complex theme by itself it has interrelations with several other environmental factors as well as with social issues which is why you know the concept of the theme today of integrated sustainable environment um, applies uh, you know to climate change probably much more than any other dimension i, I do have a presentation which i will use selectively as you know um, some of the uh, issue the text and the charts may be a little daunting, but I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. As I bring up the presentation, uh, I think it will be useful for uh, all of us to quickly go through some of the fundamentals of climate change. I'm sure some of you would know uh, about it in depth. Some of you will be aware, uh, aware of it at a broad level. Uh, essentially, it, the Climate change problem has been known to us at least for the last five to six decades, though it came into public prominence only the last 30 years uh, when it was proven conclusively that when the concentration of certain gases in the atmosphere called greenhouse gases, uh, as they increase, the atmosphere warms up. Uh, and these gases are gases like uh, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, and so on. This is a problem that is well known to all of us. And uh, one thing that distinguishes climate change from other environmental problems like water or waste and so on is that uh, even in its physical aspects, it is a global problem. In the sense that what I do here in India, the effects of that uh, are not restricted to India or to wherever I stay, to the, to the city I stay, which is Bangalore or the state, Karnataka. It has an effect on the global atmospheric dynamics of warming. And uh, therefore, countries, governments of countries across the world, recognizing this, have been trying to address this issue for the last three decades. Uh, the second aspect of climate change is that it is interrelated with water, with uh, biodiversity, uh, with social issues of communities, and so on. Now, uh, when we talk about climate change and the goals that we want to achieve, there are a couple of things that are frequently talked about. One is how do we cap or how do we uh, restrict the increase of average global atmospheric temperature to a certain level 
which is currently under, uh, widely agreed to be 1.5 degree centigrade. This rise of temperature 1.5 degree centigrade, as you all know, is with reference to what was existing before the Industrial Revolution started about 250 years back. So that's the global target. How do you keep global temperature rise within 1.5 degrees centigrade compared to uh, 200 to 300 years back? Unfortunately, uh, we are very, very close to that. We are already 1.1, 1.2 degrees centigrade. And therefore, there is seems to be very little time or space, maneuvering space for us to be within this limit. Every year, governments from across the world, they get together at an annual conference called Conference of Parties, called COP, to see what should be done. How do you accelerate climate actions? Uh, how do you keep humanity within safe limits? And so on. Uh, and in this conference, not only governments, but all other stakeholders come together, academia, civil society, businesses. Uh, the most recent conference was held in Glasgow in November. And uh, we, uh, one of the good things that happened in that conference was that you had many, many more countries actually committing to reductions of their greenhouse gases. Because I think governments across the world are realizing that time is running out and therefore we must really do something drastic and we must do, do it fast. So if you look at this slide, uh, it essentially shows that 92 countries representing about nearly 80% of global carbon emissions have made what are called net zero commitments. Uh, a net zero commitment is basically a commitment by a country that by a certain year, the uh, effective greenhouse gas or carbon emissions will be zero. Which means if they emit, even if they emit some carbon emissions, they will also uh, make sure that it is uh, absorbed back or sequestered or whatever the term that is used so that in effect, the countries are emitting zero emissions. So we've had 92 countries now making net zero commitments, including India, which now has a commitment of 2070 as the year by which our emissions will be net zero. Uh, not only countries, I think even businesses, uh, business, by the way, companies like us, like Wipro, which I represent, uh, have a very big role in climate change, not only as causes of climate change, because a lot of carbon emissions come from industry, come from business. Uh, you know, wh whether you make steel or whether you make cars or uh, whether you run a data center from which you, uh, you know, uh, through which you are able to see a webinar like this, all of that uh, consume energy and therefore have a carbon footprint. Uh, it's very important, therefore, that businesses must take primary responsibility of reducing their own carbon emissions. So we've had a lot of companies also making net zero commitments in the last five years. And we also have uh, uh, the world of finance, which tries to see what are the technologies one must invest in. They are also, uh, you know, gearing up and trying to see uh, how to channel more and more of investments into what are called sustainable investments or into technologies like renewable energy, electric cars, uh, all the uh, technologies underlying that, like uh, uh, grid scale battery or large batteries that can store energy and so on. That's, so that's, that's, uh, that's a good thing that is happening. Uh, so the kind of uh, technologies that uh, investors and finance people are looking at is renewable energy, battery storage, electric mobility, sustainable aviation fuel. You know, today, uh, uh, flights, air, air flights, are one of the big causes of global greenhouse gas emissions. And because it, it burns uh, jet fuel, which is very carbon intensive. How do you uh, develop alternatives that are low carbon? Is again, a, a very important goal uh, from our collective perspective. Now, uh, let me just move to the next slide. Now, uh, what we're also seeing is that some of the 
updated developments in climate science are showing us some trends that are not, not so good news. Uh, earlier, for example, we thought that if you increase carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas emissions concentration in the atmosphere, uh, the temperature rise can be somewhere in the range of... Excuse me, uh, your slides are not changing. Slides are not changing, one minute. Just a sec, I don't know. Uh, is it still in the first slide? The first, first slide is visible and it is constant. Okay. Still not changing? Uh, there is Srinivas and on my end, the slides, your slides are moving. Oh, okay. For you, the slides are moving. Yes. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I'm not too sure then uh, because it looks like it is working for some. And uh, let me do one thing. Let me. Maybe maybe it's on the right slide right now. Uh, what they are showing is slide number three. And I think what ah. is, that's what you are also presenting right now. Yeah. Okay. Is it moved to slide four now? In. Hello. Is it moving now? Uh, they, they, uh, colleagues from Neri, like you guys are muted. Please Is unmute and please unmute and talk. So now your slides are changing. Okay, all right. Okay, <laughs> thanks. So I was saying that you know uh, uh, the recent updates in climate science research actually have narrowed the gap or narrowed the band of effective uh, temperature rise. So we are actually seeing now that if I, let's say, for example, our greenhouse gas concentrations double uh, uh, from the baseline level, temperature rise is going to be from between 2.3 to 4.5 degrees centigrade. It's going to be much higher than what was earlier thought of 1.5 to 4.5 degrees centigrade. What this means is that, you know, uh, not only do we have to accelerate our actions, mitigation actions, but we have to do it faster. So we don't have even that little bit of luxury that we thought we had even say five years back. And so that is one. The second aspect which is often talked about when we uh, uh, talk about solutions for climate change is land use change. Now there's a very broad term, land use change. Land use change includes multiple things. It includes things like uh, deforestation, where you cut down forests for the purpose of, let's say, growing food, you know, for, for the purpose of agriculture or uh, industry. Uh, land use change can also mean the other way around, when you're aforesting, when you're creating new forests. Right Now, because forests play such an important role in climate because of their absorption capacity of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, uh, any kind of land use change is going to have a uh, very, very significant and critical impact on how the climate change trajectory moves forward. And what the recent research is showing is that uh, while to some extent things like afforestation or because you know of this very ironical fact that more of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has the so-called fertilization effect or it helps in the northern temperate zones, uh, you know, uh, trees to grow faster. And therefore, there might be some minor offsetting effect. But overall, uh, you know, deforestation and other kinds of land use change is the impacts of it are going to be very severe. 
And because we are also going to um, run out of our nitrogen and phosphorus budgets, which are uh, used in agriculture, that will also have an impact on to what extent can uh, afforestation and deforestation, that whole equation, play a role uh, in uh, climate change. I think all of us intuitively understand that the uh, impact of changing climate on water can be very severe because a warming temperature does change the water cycle. All of you know the water cycle from high school science. Uh, you know, the way uh, water evaporates over oceans, part of it falls back as rain, and then, uh, you know, the whole cycle. Now, we are seeing that that is already changing, and that is only going to become worse. There are going to be uh, uh, extremes in the patterns of precipitation, of drought, and uh, the unfortunate uh, impact of all of this is going to fall the hardest on people who will be, who are least geared up or least equipped to cope up with this, the vulnerable, the poor, and so on. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on um, what our climate change commitment is, just a couple of points, because it will lead then to what could be the possible solutions and challenges. As a company, we have made a... a commitment to become net zero by the year 2040 with an intermediate target of about 60% reduction in our emissions by 2030. Now, typically when companies talk about emissions, our carbon emissions, we divide it into three scopes, scope one, scope two, and scope three. Uh, scope one is uh, the emissions from the uh, equipment that we use internally. Like it could be a steel plant uh, having a blast furnace, uh, you know, which results in direct carbon emissions, or it could be diesel generators and so on. Scope two is the carbon emissions from the electricity that all of us consume. We all know that the electricity we consume come from some distant power plant, thermal power plant, hydro power plant, whatever that may be. So the carbon emissions associated with that is scope two. And scope three is really all the emissions associated with uh, a lot of activities that we do which are not directly under a company's control. Like I might be going by car or by two-wheeler every day to office. So the carbon emissions associated with that. Or I might be taking a plane or a train to move to another city, right? So what are the carbon emissions associated with that? So these are the three scopes on which we have targets of 100% net zero by 2040 and around 55 to 60% reduction by 2030. One part of our commitment is that we will be 100% renewable energy uh, in our uh, energy consumption by 2030. Currently, we are about 45%, right? And so we will move towards a target of 100% by 2030. Uh, now, one of the big things that are talked about is when you have a net zero commitment, whether it is by a country like India or by a company like us, uh, there is a, a certain amount of carbon emissions that you will not be able to reduce whatever you do. Even if you're 100% renewable energy, there will always be some amount that will be left. So how do you therefore neutralize that? Neutralizing that would mean you try to remove it from the atmosphere through several techniques, typically afforestation or using soil to sequester or absorb carbon and so on. Now, these are therefore the ways, some of the ways in which companies like us are looking at uh, contributing to climate change mitigation and doing our own bit because companies like us are responsible for a lot of uh, carbon emissions and climate change. Now, let me talk about uh, some of the emerging solutions. What are the opportunities and challenges? Now, one thing which is very clear in the last 10 years is that technology change is going to happen much faster than we think. This chart might seem a little complicated, but I will just simplify it and tell you this. 10 years back, be it solar photovoltaic technology, be it wind power, be it batteries for electric cars. The projections that we were making for these technologies in terms of by how much will it increase in terms of scale, by how much will the cost decrease, because feasibility of cost is very important. Uh, and now if you fast forward to today, the difference between what we had predicted or forecast 10 years back and what we are seeing today is very high. Uh, capacity increase is actually in solar photovoltaics is 
the actual solar photovoltaic increase has become 36 times more than what we predicted 10 years back. Right? The actual cost reduction in solar photovoltaic technology is three times that what we have predicted 10 years back. So the point of this is that we are not very good collectively at predicting how technologies are going to move. And therefore, we should, we should expect to see an even more faster rate of change in some of these technologies in the years to come. This is again a very interesting chart. I'll just uh, read out some or one or two elements of this. One of the challenges as we go into green technologies like uh, solar, wind power, or electric technologies is that you're going to have to use a lot of new metals and minerals. Uh, tellurium, for example, uh, is a mineral that is uh, used in solar panels and solar photovoltaic, photovoltaic panels. Uh, neodymium is a metal that is used in electric cars a lot. And uh, what this chart really shows is compared to conventional technologies like thermal, uh, nuclear, hydro, uh, the number one, widely available. Uh, the answer is actually no. Second is uh, you cannot therefore avoid mining these metals. Uh, for those of us who thought that a transition to uh, a green future means that we are, we are going to get rid of coal mining and you know all its uh, negative impacts. Uh, unfortunately, that's not going to be true. We are in fact going to be mining more, even more, for other kinds of metals and minerals, right? And therefore, that throws up other kind of social issues that are associated with mining. Uh, and the related challenge of this whole transition, therefore, is that what is called materials intensity, the amount of materials that you use per unit of, let's say, renewable power generated, is actually going to be much more for wind and solar compared to coal. Though its carbon footprint is going to be less, you're going to use much more materials. And that's true for electric vehicles also. All electric vehicles are going to use much more materials, uh, minerals and metals compared to conventional cars. So that does throw us through us uh, through a challenge in terms of supply constraints, in terms of social issues. Uh, this chart, for example, shows for several of these metals and min uh, minerals like neodymium or uh, lithium or tellurium, the demand that is going to come up is going to be much more, far higher than supply. And therefore, sooner or later, we will have to look at scientific substitutes for these metals and minerals. Uh, now, coming to this uh, uh, carbon removal technologies or carbon removal options, there are several options for removing carbon from the atmosphere, starting from afforestation to soil sequestration to uh, you know, water carbon or absorbing carbon in water bodies and so on. The problem is, the challenges that these are going to face is, is this. There are at least three questions. Is it socially just? When you uh, deforest or even when you create new forests, uh, often it might result in displacement of communities who are there, or it might impact their existing livelihoods. Right. So is it socially just? Second question is, is it ecologically sound? You know, in, in our uh, eagerness to create new forests, are we creating monocultures? Because you are destroying biodiversity or biodiverse forests and replacing that with monocultures, right? So that's not good. Uh, second and third, is there enough land available or waste land? We cannot use productive land. So is there enough waste land available for all the carbon removal commitments that countries are making, that uh, businesses are making, that all of us are making, and what are its political implications? Unfortunately, back of the envelope calculations show that not enough land is available. You know, if you have to meet all these carbon removal commitments. Now, I, I realize that I've come to the end of my time, so I just wanted to place some some of these high level issues uh, as we go ahead, as we look ahead at the whole climate change mitigation uh, pathway in front of us. There are several opportunities in front of us. There's no doubt. It's very encouraging that uh, you know stakeholders across are making commitments to climate change mitigation. That's fantastic. And I think we should keep doing that. Uh, but at the same time, we must also be cognizant of 
challenges like of the kind that uh, I have uh, placed. And these are just some illustrations. Uh, this, these by no means are the entire exhaustive list of challenges. But I'm sure, you know, science has come to a rescue several times in the past. Uh, the combination of uh, judicious use of science and technology from a humanistic perspective, uh, along with the energy of the young people that we have in our country, uh, will be able to we will be able to apply our minds to some of these very complex issues and figure out solutions as we go along. With that, I come to the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Sir, thank you very much uh, for your enlightening talk on climate change. That uh, we got uh, glimpses of the fundamentals of climate change and how India is moving towards uh, uh, net zero emissions, carbon emissions, and uh, how we are targeting and what are the possible uh, challenges there and, uh, and uh, what will be the options. So, sir, thank you very much. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So now I am uh, going to my next segment of this program. I am profusely elated to take an opportunity to introduce the next guest speaker, Dr. Srinivasan Ramaswamy, Center for Sustainable Technologies, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Dr. Ramaswamy is an associate professor at the Center for Sustainable Technologies in the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He obtained PhD in Environmental Engineering from Hamburg University of Technology. He is currently working in the area of freshwater treatment. Dr. Ramaswamy is group leader of Sustainable Water Lab at Indian Institute of Science Bangalore. He is involved in developing sustainable wastewater treatment technologies for safeguarding and replenishing our precious water resources. Now, may I now request Dr. Ramaswamy to address the participants, please. So, good afternoon to everyone. So, thank you for having me here. It's my pleasure to be here. So, thanks again for providing this opportunity. So realizing that there are also young minds in this in the audience. So I am also modifying my talk a little bit so that the entire audience can be accommodated into the talk. So thank you for giving the kind introduction. So I would be talking on a concept for removing ammonia from wastewaters using landfill leachate as an example. Yeah, so we would be the concept is using fixed bed biofilm reactors. So what you see here is a fixed bed biofilm reactor where bacteria or microorganisms are growing inside. And as an example, I would like to propose or what we have studied in the past on leachate treatment. So leachate is a highly complicated polluted wastewater which is generated from solid dumps. So to the left you can see landfills or solid dumps so these are not engineered these are just open dumps but once they are engineered and uh, then they are called as sanitary landfills so there would be a provision to also collect the wastewater and also it has to be treated subsequently yeah so mr narayan had mentioned about uh, nitrogen and its limitation or the availability so this is also the place where i would also like to start so ammonia is there in wastewaters yeah and once or if there is a technology to convert it and also bring it to usable form, so that would be one of the options would be utilizing nitrification. So we move on to leachate origin, a little bit about landfill leachate and its characteristics. So in the first slide, I had presented an image of a landfill. So here again is a pictorial representation of a landfill. So landfill leachate is formed predominantly from the percolation of precipitation, so let's say rain in the Indian subcontinent or in the context, so through landfill waste. So as the water goes through the solid dump, it will dissolve the pollutants from the waste which has been deposited or dumped there, and it will be collected at the bottom. So in a sanitary or engineered landfill, there should be provisions to collect this and treat it. Yeah, if it is not collected, if its movement is not arrested or prevented, so what will happen is that the leachate will go further into the ground through the soil and it will start contaminating the groundwaters. So leachate is characterized by high organic compounds concentration and ammonia content. 
Additionally, it can have other metal ions, alkali and alkaline earth, alkaline earth metal ions, heavy metals, and other anions. So it is of high interest to collect this and treat this, which otherwise would pollute our environment. So unlike landfill gas, so landfills also generate these so-called greenhouse gases, as said by Mr. Narayan during his last presentation, which have a global warming effect. So landfill gas should also be collected. But it can be seen that landfill gas needs to be collected only for about 10 to 15 years after closure of a landfill, which typically is the case, whereas landfill leachate should be collected and treated for at least 100 years, so even after the closure of a landfill. And unlike organic compounds which are going to be present in the leachate, ammonia concentration will not decrease with the aging of a landfill or with time. The reason we will also see in the next slide briefly uh, so the reason is that inside the landfills, uh, it's under anaerobic condition. So ammonia does not undergo any change under anaerobic environment. Ammonia emissions, or when ammonia enters the receiving water bodies, lakes, rivers, etc., they would cause oxygen depletion because of its conversion to nitrate. And it also leads to algal bloom and subsequently eutrophication. And it can also have acute toxicity effects in water bodies, causing fish kills and kills of other aquatic organisms. So here you can see, I hope it is very well visible. So what you see is that the organic compounds in the leachate, their concentration decreases with aging of a landfill or with time. This is due to the decomposition of these compounds inside the landfill body. Yeah, so with time, the concentration go, goes down. A similar trend can be also seen usually for heavy metals because under anaerobic environments, sulfate, which will be also there in the leachate, will get reduced to sulfide, and then heavy metals are going to be precipitated as metal sulfides. So their concentration would also decrease with time. So this graph here now shows ammonium, chloride, and sulfate. So sulfate, as I just mentioned, its concentration decreases with time, whereas you can see both ammonium represented by, this, represented by the solid line and chloride by this broken line does not decrease. So ammonium is going to become a major pollutant from a landfill in the long term. So this table here just summarizes what we saw in these graphs again, just to emphasize again that ammonium concentration is going to be high during all stages of a landfill. Whereas the organics represented by COD and VOD are going to decrease with time. Same applies to even heavy metals. So now we come to the fundamentals of nitrification and nitrification of landfill leachate. So I would like to present uh, nitrification phenomena as an example or leachate as an example for a wastewater where we can achieve very high nitrification rates or very good nitrification rates with using very small reactors. So nitrification process or nitrification denitrification is the most widely used method for nitrogen removal from wastewaters. So maybe in the environmental science subjects, maybe many of you might have learned already. So this process involves microorganisms converting ammonium to nitrate and subsequently reducing nitrate to nitrogen gas so that we protect our water bodies from the effects that we have talked earlier. So among these two steps or processes, nitrification is the slowest and it's very delicate. So it is carried out by two groups of organisms. So in the first step, ammonium gets converted to nitrite in the presence of a special group of organisms or microorganisms called ammonia oxidizing organisms. And in the second step, nitrite gets converted to nitrate by another, which will be converted by another group of organisms called nitrite oxidizing organisms. So both of them are usually different classes of bacteria which are doing these conversion processes. So in comparison or when comparing ammonium, nitrite and nitrate, nitrate is a very stable product. So plants also like, or nitrate is the form in which uh, nitrate, uh, plants uptake nitrogen. Most of the plants uptake nitrogen in nitrate form. So if we convert ammonium to nitrate in our wastewaters and make it suitable for use, 
that will be one way to recover nitrate or use it for agricultural purposes as long as the water is safe to be used so there are other challenges or concerns but this is one way to recover nitrogen and another thing is that when ammonium is released so this is going to cause oxygen depletion what we saw earlier in water bodies because in water bodies again bacteria will oxidize so the oxygen concentration in the waters will decrease causing uh, fish kills and the death of other aquatic organisms another thing is that we will also use this loose uh, ammonium because uh, ammonium will get converted to ammonia gas uh, due to the action by uh, algae in receiving water so again we lose this uh, nutrient which could otherwise be captured and used for uh, cultivation so these bacteria are uh, very slow growing uh, so compared to other microorganisms which are there in wastewater treatment they are very slow growing so the factors which affect the nitrification process are the the solids retention time or the sludge change this means the time for which we keep the microorganisms in the system temperature affects the microbiological process of course ammonia which is their food the concentration of it affects uh, the process requires oxygen as we have seen earlier so oxygen availability is essential and the process is also affected by ph so here is an example or photos from a wastewater treatment plant so this is usually what is done at wastewater treatment plants where we have the microorganisms in large tanks it is aerated so as to remove both organics uh, and also remove nutrients so uh, there would be a tank where it is aerated and subsequently a clarifier is used to separate so the sludge particles will settle it, settle down in a clarifier and then it will be brought back into the tank and some part of it will be wasted so when it comes to leachate the problem is that the sludge does not settle so easily like in this picture here so then what would happen is that the sludge will not settle here and then it escapes with the effluent so that the process will become unstable right so these are some of the previous studies uh, on leachate nitrification uh, i will not go into much detail here but the challenge is that since the sludge does not settle uh, the process will become unstable yeah and so it is only possible to operate with very low sludge concentrations in full scale systems and so the nitrification rates which are possible use make a note of this number which is about 300 g per cubic meter a day uh, these are quite low in comparison to what can be realized in biofilm systems on the other hand biofilm reactors or fixed film reactors rely on microorganisms which are growing attached to surfaces such as shown in this figure here so the good thing is that micro microorganisms are stuck to such surfaces so they are going to be there and they will not be washed out from the system so these provide high surface areas per unit volume of reactor so it is possible to reduce the volume of reactor which is needed for treatment and another thing is that they immobilize like i already said so that these nitrifying organisms which are slow growing are can are able to grow nicely in such reactors so using very small reactor volumes high nitrification rates and efficient process can be realized so um fixed bed reactor what we saw in the early slides uh, the diagram which was there is one of the most compact reactor with which gives highest specific surface areas so we can see here in this slide so if you look at the different biofilm reactor types so some of the types are called trickling filter rotating biological contractor biofilter or the fixed bed reactor and moving bed biofilm reactor so the logic or the correlation behind surface area and efficiency can be seen here so higher the surface area you can remove more pollutants per unit volume of the reactor so you can see that Uh, so these submerged biofilters which have the highest specific surface area 
or surface area per unit volume of reactor they can remove up to 10 kilograms of oxygen demand or biochemical oxygen demand per unit volume per day whereas you see like the other variants such as mbbr lies between 1.5 to 4.5 and trickling filter is only about 0.4 so this is again a summary of the different materials uh, which are available or which can be used for the different reactor types uh, and you can see that as the particle diameter or size of the material decreases the there is a linear relationship between surface area which is available and the particle diameter as the particle diameter decreases one can get more surface area for these reactors so we had used three different uh, reactor media or for these are called bio carriers so we had used one carbonaceous uh, material similar to coal or coke uh, then we had used made use of a plastic uh, bio carrier and expanded clay beads so what we had seen is that we had operated the fixed bed reactors using these different media like we had used four reactors and they were packed with the different media so what you can see from this table is that or even here in this column is that the coke material so if you may have learned about the adsorption capacity or the possibility for carbonaceous material to adsorb pollutants so although they had a moderate porosity due to the high adsorption capacity which promotes the growth of other microorganisms inside the reactor they clogged much faster uh, whereas the clay beads due to its low adsorption capacity even though it had a low porosity porosity means how much voidage or uh, the how much gaps are present when you put these together yeah so due to even though it had low porosity it was possible to operate it for a much longer period without backwashing so here we had operated the reactors without uh, disturbing them we wanted to see how long we can operate it and uh, the reactor with the plastic bio carrier uh, which had the highest porosity and it also does not adsorb organic compounds it was possible to operate it as long as 13 months and then uh, we stopped these batch experiments and we moved on to experiments in continuous flow yeah so from these trials we decided to make more studies with clay beads and pe carrier because they are more durable so here are just some values uh, a summary of the different nitrification rates which we achieved uh, during our study so in so if you remember so typically in landfill leachate so people were able to get only less than 300 and uh, in one of the earlier studies in fact fixed bed reactor or packed bed reactor uh, they had demonstrated about 130 so in the leachate we were able to get close to 600 g per cubic meter a day uh, which is about five times higher compared to what previously previously the other researchers had achieved yeah and in nano filtration permeate of the same uh, which uh, was so nano filtration is a membrane process uh, so you imagine a tea filter where the filter can remove you know like the tea dust while making the tea yeah so a uh, membrane uh, can remove some of the components or compounds or pollutants from waste water while selectively allowing water and maybe some more uh, pollutants or ions through it so once the organic compounds were removed we were able to get much higher nitrification rates uh, using the same reactor so these are also trials from different stages uh, where uh, we achieved as high as 1300 g per cubic meter a day uh, and thereby we had demonstrated that the packed bed reactors can be used for achieving very good nitrification rates even in a complicated waste water as a landfill leachate um even salinities so usually salt water you may have studied that it's uh, has uh, it has properties of killing bacteria or affecting them so uh, in our reactors that had not happened so in literature you would see that the percentage removal or the efficiency decreases when the salinity increases 
whereas in our case uh, even at salinities of about uh, 16 gram per liter as chloride or about 26 gram per liter as nacl uh, which corresponds to which can be compared with the value here so they were able to apply only about 233 gram per cubic meter a day and there also only about 50% removal had taken place whereas we were able to achieve full nitrification applying about 700 gram per cubic meter a day in one of the reactors and in the other pe carrier reactor uh, we were able to get twice of that so by this i would just like to say that the biofilm reactor or fixed bed reactor appears or is a very promising technique for nitrification of waste waters or ammonia removal from waste waters so that finally coming to the takeaway message uh, fixed bed biofilm reactor is a promising technology for realizing high nitrification rates in waste waters and also in landfill leachates which are which is a highly complicated waste water uh, the parameters which influence the process are ph dissolved oxygen temperature of course water upflow velocity also has an effect because this is going to affect the mass transfer inside the reactors uh, we also saw or learned that bed porosity and adsorption capacity of the media and organic concentration in feed water could influence the operability and also the process itself so the organic compounds in the landfill leachate in this case it was a stable or a mature landfill leachate and it was causing nitrification inhibition or it was affecting the microorganisms finally it was also demonstrated or shown that by increasing the salinity or chloride content gradually uh, even with salinities as high as 26 parts per thousand we were able to achieve stable or efficient nitrification and there was no detrimental effect on the microorganisms thank you for your attention um uh, sir we are unable to hear you if you could yeah, unmute yeah. yourself yeah please unmute it is true that uh, wastewater treatment is a major challenge and to overcome this challenge we need some robust technologies such as fixed uh, biofilm react by reactor and the research uh, we carried out at uh, isc uh, navy and other places and on this uh, national science day that uh, i think in near future we will get some robust technologies because uh, wastewater technology wastewater treatment has been a major challenge for india and in the coming time uh, with uh, the sustainable development and uh, uh, urbanization then industrialization uh, we need some uh, more technology so thank you sir for your message and you give me the nice illustrations illustrated your uh, this uh, uh, important area so thank you very much now moving to the next segment of this program thank you now i have uh, the pleasure to introduce our next uh, speaker uh, next guest speaker dr swarup datta dr swarup datta is currently assistant professor at department of policy and management studies in the terry school of advanced studies new delhi earlier he worked as consultant in indian Council of Social Science Research (ICSSR) Ministry of Child and Human Resource Development Government of India. He holds PhD in social anthropology and has found profound research experiences in various national and international development organizations. He, along with Professor S K Thora, Chairman ICSSR and former Chairman EDC, and Dr. Samar Verma, IIDC candidate, have edited a book titled "Social Science Research in India: Status, Issues, and Policies." Recently, he has been nominated as fellow of Royal Anthropological Institute, Great Britain, and Ireland. He was also an associate fellow in Council for Social Department uh, Development, New Delhi. His research interest lies in sustainable development, agricultural anthropology, environmental anthropology, tribal and Dalit issues. He has been a visiting faculty in Department of Environmental Studies, University of Delhi, and National Museum Institute of History of Arts, Conservation, and Museology. Ministry of Culture, Government of India. 
May I request Dr. Swaroop to address the Good afternoon, everyone. So myself, Swaroop, and uh, I'm going to talk about a very important and very relevant uh, uh, understanding on uh, Anthropocene. Just a minute. I'm just going to share the slides with you. So uh, I hope everyone can see the slides. Yes. Okay. Yes, the Great. Slides are yes. Okay. So today, uh, a very uh, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a, a kind of understanding that we are all living in a world where uh, we created a chaos. I will discuss about this chaos today, and I think all of us to, uh, should know at how this chaos has been made, and and how to address this problem today. So, welcome uh, students and the uh, fellows and faculties for the for this lecture. And I am going to deliver a very important and very relevant and uh, and very uh, uh, you know uh, relevant topic on the Anthropocene. Uh, and uh, we need to understand why it is important and why it is important, especially for the in the era of the sustainable development that we are living. So we are having MDGs that is Millennium Development Goal, and we are having the SDGs now that is Sustainable Development Goals. And why this uh, the recognizing the Anthropocene is very crucial for us. That's what today's discussion. Now, before I go for this, I would like to know uh, from you, many of you have a heard of it, and those who are the students, I can see that you know, our entire global era could be divided into various phases. So largest section that we can call that we have two yawns, that is cryptozoic and phenozoic yawns. Okay, there's a millions and millions of years. Okay, and yawns are divided into two eras, and eras are divided into periods, and periods are divided into epochs. Now, if you look at the, the current uh, situation where we are right now, is that we are in the Cenozoic era of the Quaternary period. And the Quaternary period is that is the, the current uh, era where the entire human evolution took place. All right. And if you look at the uh, you know, previous era, that is the Paleozoic and Mesozoic. In the Mesozoic, you know, we have the Jurassic, Triassic, and Cretaceous. So all this, the evolution of the reptiles, evolution of the uh, you know, plants, various plants and animal species, and the and the erosion of the uh, the the biggest reptiles, that is the that is uh, uh, you know, dinosaurs, th that happened in the era of Mesozoic. Okay. Now. In the tertiary area, we have the rise of birds and, and placental mammals. That means that is the, the complete evolution took place in the tertiary era of the uh, tertiary period of the Cenozoic era. Now, when we talk about the quaternary era and then we are having the epochs, that is a tertiary and quaternary, and this is a era Cenozoic. So here you see that Paleozoic, Paleocene, uh, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, and Pliocene, and these are all the part of the tertiary period. And where are we right now? That is what we call the Holocene period. Is here. So today, that is uh, uh, in the in the 21st century, we are in the era of Holocene. Okay, with what we call the epoch, Holocene epoch. Okay, and this is the largely the part of the quaternary period. Those who are uh, well aware of the geology, they must be knowing that there is a geology, geology called, there is a sub-branch within the geology called quaternary geology. Now, once we get into, into, the, into the Holocene uh, uh, series, we can see there are uh, three main subdivision. Okay, please look at this graph, as uh, sorry, table. Here you can see that we have three uh, sub-series of it. One is Greenlandian, North Gripian and Meghalayan. And this Meghalayan period is the recent one, what we talk about the, the current date of the world or the Earth's uh, system, that is a Meghalayan period. And uh, North Gripian and Greenlandian, that is there, that is the early part of the Holocene. The Holocene, lower Holocene, 11,700 years B2K. That means B2K means before 2000. And Ka, that is kilo annum. And the Ma, that is one mega annum. One mega annum equal to one millions of years. So here you see in the 
Holocene, we have only uh, 11,700 years back. So Holocene actually started, uh, uh, you know, 11,700 years back. And then we have the North Gripian and finally we have the Meghalayan period. So Meghalayan period is a recent one. Now, you must be surprised to know that why this term Meghalayan has been coined. And that is a basic question that may arise in your mind. Now, before, before I start the Meghalayan period, let me give you a very basics of the Holocene period. How this term Holocene actually come? The Holocene actually come in the post-glacial geological epoch, which is a past 10 to 12,000 years BP, as agreed upon by the International Geological Congress in Bologna in 1885. So in the year of 1885, it was actually decided that we are in the current stage and that started with the 11,000 after the uh, after the glacian, uh, glaciations or the glacial period ended. Okay, And therefore, we have the sediments of the Holocene's different parts of the world and therefore the geologists agreed that we are in the stage of the Holocene. Okay. Now, once we talk about the Meghalayan period, the Meghalayan period, which is the latest one, which has been actually commissioned uh, uh, on on the on July 2018 by the International Commission of Stratigraphy, which is the uppermost stage of the Quaternary uh, uh, Quaternary period. Okay. And this is uh, this is the global boundary of the. Uh, stratotype section and point is is, is called the Krem Mamlu Cave. That's formation over there in Meghalaya. And you know, in the Meghalaya, it's the northeastern state of India, and there are hundreds of caves over there in these regions. So geologists and other scientists excavated, and they have found, and they have found, and they have uh, they have uh, done a series of research into in these uh, caves, and they have made uh, in, made a various stratigraphical analysis. And after the stratigraphical analysis, it was found that Meghalaya points is a, one of the most recent point that we actually started 4,200 years BP. It's suitable for preserving the chemical science of the transition of the ages because it's actually suitable. And I will show you the photograph. And here you see the photograph of the, uh, uh, of the cave called Krem Mamlu. Here you see the all kind of depositions are there. And when you go more detail, when you go, go for a stratigraphical analysis of it, please look at this uh, picture. Here you see that scientists have discovered that this particular period, this is 4.2 interval is the Meghalayan period. That is 4,200 years. So I'm coming back to the uh, discussion that actually it was, uh, you know, we, we know that history told us that it was uh, almost 4,000 or 5,000 years, various civilizations started. If we start uh, with the uh, you know, civilization called Meso uh, Mesopotamian civilization, uh, then Indus Valley civilization, so different civilization across the world, you know, in, in Egypt, Greece, Syria, okay, all this uh, region, they have actually flourished, but this some, somewhere they also diminished slowly and gradually they declined. Okay, so here the last point clearly mentions that this age began with the 200 years of drought that impacted the human civilization in Egypt, Greece and Syria, Mesopotamia and Indus Valley and the Yangtze River Valley. Now, let us uh, talk a quick look at uh, the human evolution. So this is one period that I'm talking about that is the Meghalayan period and after that, that is a Holocene uh, epoch. Within the, within the Holocene epoch, we have three subdivisions, North Gripian, Greenlandian, and finally the Meghalayan, which is the recent one. Now, this is the human evolution. You see that various species of the human evolutions. The, before starting the Holocene, we have the Pleistocene epoch. And this Pleistocene epoch, we have a series of uh, uh, fossil remains, which we have found, starting from, uh, you know, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, and modern hum, uh, Homo genus, that is Homo sapiens sapiens. We have several other species of human that is called Homo Heidelberg genesis. So it was told that during this entire revolution period, we have series of glacial and interglacial period in Europe, in Africa. In, you know, in, in Africa, it was pluvial. In Europe, it was glacial. Okay, glacial period means it, there's a, uh, uh, you know, the, for those who do not know, that there is a massive, uh, uh, you know, ice sheets which come down to the entire uh, northern and western part of the Europe. The temperature uh, came down to 
uh, few uh, minus uh, 10 degree or 15 degree general and average temperature. So that was a glacial period in the northern Europe, which has its long term implications over there. And during this glacial period, we know that there is a there is a one uh, weak species called Uli Mammoth who flourished. And it was the named Homo sapiens neanderthalensis who were the, they're the species of that during this time. Slowly and gradually, they interbreed and intermix with the genus Homo sapiens and they eroded. So today, what we call the Homo sapiens, and today, uh, you know, we have a separate subspecies that is Neanderthalensis. We have another subspecies, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are different subspecies in, 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 in Iran. We have few uh, fossil remains from Iraq. We have few fossil remains and also in Syria. Now, coming back to the main discussion, given the background of all these things. Now, why this is important? Because if we need to understand what the Anthropocene is, therefore, we need to understand that why uh, we should call today's era as an Anthropocene. And this is the debate. And this debate, I think everyone should understand it. Now, it was long back, actually, in 1864, when Marsh published a book called Man and Nature, and more recently reprinted as, as Earth as modified by human action. And if you look at the picture, this side, you see the series of, uh, uh, you know, Cambrians uh, to Quaternary. So different periods and epochs has been mentioned. And if you see that the in the Ice Age period, you know, many of you have, uh, you have seen the Ice Age movie. And this is the Ice Age period where uh, it actually, uh, in the entire Pleistocene period and the Quaternary period is completely based on this Ice Age period. Now today, we will talk about why uh, the why this new era is very important for uh, uh, for today's discussion and why this is uh, uh, this is to be addressed by the geologist. Now, Stupani in 19, 1873 clearly mentioned that human activities as a new telluric forces, which is in power and universality, may be compared to the greater forces of the earth. That is called the Anthropozoic era. Now, when Paul Kurtzen in 2000, he's a, he's a professor in chemistry, and he, for the first time, he actually observed that there is a massive depletion over there in the ozone layer over the Antarctica, and and therefore he he was uh, awarded uh, Nobel, uh, 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 you know, and therefore it was his study for the first time. He showed that uh, he showed the world that it was the anthropogenic activities which led to the massive problem in the ozone uh, ozone layer that we call the ozone hole. And it was so extensive that has been damaged to the biosphere caused by human activist, uh, activities since the time of Industrial Revolution in 1700-1800. And that present interglacial, so because he, uh, he, he thinks that we are in the present interglacial period, and hitherto named as Holocene, can be renamed as an Anthropocene. For the first time in the, in the world body, in the, in, the, in, the, in the international forum, he raised the point that we should call this era called Anthropo. Anthropo means human and sin means the epoch and era. So we are in the era of human because we anything that is happening, it is only due to the human activities that is actually happening. Then the what is the definition of it? Then he gave a very clear cut definition. He said, a period marked by a regime change in the activity of industrial societies, which began at the turn of the 19th century. You remember in the 19th century when the colonialism started, and slowly and gradually, why the colonialism start, started, it's because of industrial revolution in the Western Europe and Great Britain uh, and France. We have seen French revolutions. We have seen different parts. They have actually diffused and therefore they you know, established their colonies. And with the in the name of the colonizations, they actually captured their land. They have, they have invaded these lands and, and governed for a few hundred years. All right. So the, the, this regime change, he said that it actually started in the, in the eve of industrializations, in the in the era of uh, industrializations, and this uh, this heyday of industrializations actually led to the global disruption later on, and global disruption of what? Global disruption of entire Earth system, which which have seen the unprecedented, uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, problems in the in, across the world in the name of climate change, in the name of biodiversity loss, pollution of the sea, land and air, air resource depletion, and so on. Therefore, he actually, for the first time, talked about in the field uh, of uh, you know, it's it's an interdisciplinary field where every disciplines 
starting from development studies, social science, life science, earth science, every scientific discipline raised the concern that we have almost lost because we need you know we the human being the moment human being started controlling the earth system there is a massive disruption based on it what exactly the anthropocene subdivisions there is a debate and we need to understand why this debate actually come before that we need to understand what the stages has been divided if you look at the stages one is pre anthropocene and another is the Anthropocene. Now, when it's called the pre-Anthropocene, this is an industrial era, that is 1800 to 1945. And 1945 to 2015 is a great acceleration. And finally, 2015 onwards, we have the stewards of Earth system. This three era has been divided within the largest part of the Anthropocene. Now, what is a pre-Anthropocene? Now, pre-Anthropocene, human has less impact as compared to the uh, post-Anthropocene or the Anthropocene era. Now, in the pre-Anthropocene, this is what we ideally call the pre-industrial society. Industrial development was not, not uh, that much. You know, the machine-led production was less. Therefore, pre-Anthropocene could be equated with the pre-industrial society. And the pre-industrial society could and did modify the coastal and terrestrial ecosystem, but they did not have the numbers. Now, here the problem, the number the social and economic organizations, because even if they have modified the landscape in the name of, say, war, in the name of several uh, the modifying the land through agriculture and other, but they did not have the technology, superior technology, which completely transformed the world. Okay, Therefore, pre-industrial society is uh, less technologically developed. and But many geologists and many um, uh, you know, conservationists raise the point that in the uh, in a, in a uh, pre-Anthropocene, we lost several megafauna. One of them were, you know, uh, giant ombuds in Australia, woolly mammoth in northern Eurasia. But doubt still exists because many people said it's just because of the impact of the climate change during this time. Because the glacial period, they, you know, there is every glacial period, there is interglacial period. So it was thought that currently we are in the uh, interglacial period. So there is some doubt and you need more evidence to establish the pre-anthropocene. But look at this picture. These are the giant ombats and this is uh, uh, Uli Mammoth. Now, now let us move into the Anthropocene era. Now, Anthropocene era, which is clearly mentioned that using of fossil fuels, first coal, then oil and gas. And it started in the 1700s England. We have seen the Industrial Revolution started with the Great Britain's uh, conquer over the world in the name of colonizations. And they started producing uh, uh, the material that, in, you know, in the through establishing various industries across the Great Britain. And all the raw materials were supplied from the co colonized countries, actually, where they actually colonized. So they invaded different parts of the world, starting from South Africa and different uh, uh, South Asian countries. Okay, so even few part in US also, they invaded. So use of energy by industrial society is four to five times than the agrarian society. Now that is an estimation has given by the scientists that four to five times than the agrarian society. Those were actually depend on agriculture and energy used by the agrarian society is three to four times higher than that of hunting gathering society. All right, now, the invention of the James, uh, steam engine by James Watt in 1780 is one of the major breakthrough of the communication, revolutionary communications. And it completely changed the entire landscape of the world through the, uh, you know, it's because once the, you know, steam engine uh, uh, was discovered and then it was, uh, you know, a lot of other uh, things also discovered along with it. So transportation for this, you need to transport across the, uh, across the region, you need a lot of coal. So coal became, so and gradually coal power plant came up and all, you know, so invention and, and during this time led to the massive, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, revolution in the, in the communications. According to Mactel, uh, you know, between 1800 to 2000, we have seen that population grew more than sixfold. Global economy grew more than 50 folds and energy use grew more than 40 folds. So this is a massive population that increased from 1800 to 2000, six fold of, uh, uh, and, and now it, we are witnessing again, again, a very huge population growth. Global economy, 
the term global economy was used after 1945, but when it was estimated in the uh, uh, you know pre World War II, it was almost uh, uh, you know uh, you know increased by 50 folds. So to, today we have this 50 fold in terms of global economy. Energy use grew about 40 folds. So you using the energy through the coal, gas, uh, oil, etc. So it's 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 all, almost 40 fold. The impact of industrialization, I think that is the main, uh, you know, main point of discussions. The deforestation and the conversion to agriculture. Now, a lot of deforestation happened. Look at when Jair Bolsonaro, you know, the president of uh, Brazil, who actually uh, destroyed various parts of Amazon for, for mining purpose and agricultural purpose. And many European countries raised the concerns they said that deforestation is a major problem in the developing world and as well as in the developed world so it was it was estimated that about 10 percent of the global terrestrial surface has been domesticated at the beginning of the industrial era in 1800 but this figure rose significantly by 25 to 30 percent by 1950. changes in the hydrological cycles through various uh, you know constructing the large dams so we have seen the uh, uh, you know, hydrological cycle, cycle is uh, massive, uh, massive jeopardized, massive jeopardized because of because of uh, changing the entire landscape. Now, concentration of nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide is also in the in the pre-industrial uh, uh, period at the 1950s is again a very important uh, point of discussion. If you look at the table. The nitrous oxide, which was there, which is very uh, dangerous for uh, for the for uh, for any kind of uh, human uh, uh, human thing, and you you know, 272 parts per billion volume and 288 right now. I mean, it's the 1950s, and maybe it's 300 more than 300 right now. Now methane, uh, 18 850. Now it uh, almost 1950s. It is 1250, and carbon dioxide, 200 to 275. It is 300. So this this is a research that is con uh, conducted by Etheridge et al. And it was it's a quite a huge piece of information that they have uh, Journal of Geophysical uh, Geophysics. They have actually uh, uh, published this uh, article. Now look at this. Uh, look at this is one uh, uh, one of the major uh, thing that is uh, uh, use of uh, biomass, coal, oil, and gas. 1850 to 2000, you have uh, biomass almost stabilized. Okay, coals uh, by 1990s onwards it started increasing. Oil it is started increasing, and gas it started increasing 1950s onwards. Also, we have the you know new new nuclear. Okay, so this is uh, something we need to uh, first see that uh, how the usage of various uh, fossil fuel based energy system is actually uh, uh, you know started. Uh, uh, you know, growing. That leads to the stage two. So we have discussed on the stage one, okay, during the industrialization period, how it actually used the various resources, starting with the coal, gas, and all. Now it leads to the stage two. And this stage two is basically the use of petroleum consumption. And the motor vehicle increased 40 million in 1945 to 700 million in 1996. World population living in the urban areas increased 30 to 50 percent, and GG emission increased rapidly. So all these things led to a great acceleration period. Look at uh, the use of motor vehicles that today we are using. Accumulation of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is roughly proportional to the amount of fossil fuel that has been consumed. Hence, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration can be used as a single indicator to track the progress of Anthropocene, and it was actually mentioned by Curzon. They said that we need to see the how much uh, carbon dioxide concentration is there. And then we will talk about the progress of Anthropocene and we need to define quant quantitatively rather than subjectively or qualitatively. Look at this figure. This figure says everything. Look at uh, in the Holocene period and Anthropocene period and Anthropocene stage two period. This figure given by Curzon and it's clearly mentioned that in 2005, we 379 parts per million volume, the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. In 1800, we have 283 
that means it's the beginning of the industrial revolution sun 1800s shatabdi mein ye shuru hua tha and then 1950 we have 311 and now we have 379 therefore we have indisputable evidence of the human activity so it is not suddenly increasing because of certain issues but this is a human invaded the environment in such a way and human actually uh, affected the environment in such a way that the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration increased in that pole and which leads to the massive change in the climate that's what today we call the climate change the past 50 years human changed the world ecosystem rapidly and extensively the earth in the sixth great extinction event that was already told in 1995 by pim et al why because the human intervention in the earth system and human enterprise and associated global scale impact on many aspects of earth system functioning the mark the stage 2 of the anthropocene now this is the stage 2 of the anthropocene where people use the resources uh, indiscriminately also we have witnessed uh, before 1945 which actually staged the you know the 1940 uh, 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 you know 1945 as a mark for the great acceleration period is world war 1 great depression and world war 2 so world war 1 it started somewhere in 19 uh, 15 and 16 and then great depressions which was there in the latter part of the 1920s and where entire america was in a massive uh, famine and food crisis and then world war 2 which was again a devastating and, uh, and 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 world war 2 actually uh, why it's called the breakthrough because after that the new nation born the old nation recreated all these things happened after the world war and the new technology emerged now look at this figure and this figure is very complicated one so i will go for the only head so look at the population figure total real gdp of the countries foreign direct investment damming of rivers water use fertilizer consumption mcdonald restaurants paper consumptions urban populations transport motor vehicles communication telephones and intention to disms which actually created the human footprints over there in the environment and these entire uh you know uh, there are hundreds of activities which i i can i can tell you that increased many folds from the 1800 to 2000 and that actually it it gives a kind of proof that human being uh, you know their footprints over there on the environment is much much more uh, higher than any other species in the world and that is why we should call it as an anthropo that means human centric uh, uh development and number 3 that is the uh, stewards of the earth space and he, here we see that earth uh, in 2015 onwards we recognized that well we are in much better positions uh, and uh, because we we understood uh, what we have to do so we we are in the era of sustainable development so 1987 onwards uh, uh, you know uh, we are after the brand plan commission therefore the the idea of sustainable development emerged that we have to use the world uh, in such a way so that the, the 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 our future generation can live their life peacefully so we should not indiscriminately use our resources so to develop a universally accepted strategy to ensure sustainability of our life support system against the human induced stresses uh, of the greatest research and policy challenges over uh, to ever to confront the humanity now based on it this is a very important part of our discussion how the sustainable development can be conceptualized in the era of anthropocene well we have already see that a lot of environmental act activists across the world we have agreed that yes human being is actually uh, 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 invaded the environment and uh, destroyed the uh, environment uh, in badly now what kind of approach then we should have so there are three kind of approaches emerged in the era of anthropocene all right then three approaches one is business as usual approach chalta hai chalne do this is what we call the business as usual approach mitigation approach and finally the geo engineering approach now what we call the business as usual approach it is a market oriented approach where the most dealt uh, with the capitalist development look at us when donald trump 
completely withdraw its uh, stake from the Paris Climate Agreement. Why? Because uh, Trump mentioned clearly mentioned that we are a capitalist country. We need to uh, we need to think about because uh, 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 India and China is so responsible for it. I mean, they shifted the blame to those developing countries who are trying to uh, you know uh, <clears throat> develop their uh, country you know economically and socially. But yes, India has certain responsibility. But at the same time, US cannot blame alone because per capita consumption is much much more higher in US than India. Therefore, their approach is called the business as usual approach. They said that economic system can adapt quickly and rapidly in the changing conditions. This assumption is based on the fact that as societies have become wealthier, they have dealt effectively with some local and regional pollution problem. मतलब अगर कोई society धनी हो जाता है, वो भी अपने हिसाब से वो पूरा pollution को control कर सकता है, तो इस, इसके लिए हम कर, करें क्या? So, this is a kind of approach. Uh, it's a very uh, taken for granted approach, what we call uh, you know, more, of, uh, more of a very snobbish approach. But this is the approach which many of us are, uh, are now adjusting, that is mitigation approach. We understood that we enough has been done uh, in the environment. Now we really have to think very uh, uh, you know carefully that if, even if we are doing even if we are destroying the environment but but with environmental noise spare us you know we can see the series of uh, uh, destruction that has been uh, there in the past few years in the name of various uh, cyclone activities in, in india itself we have seen the coastal coastal cyclones are in, in that increased many folds therefore we need to understand two things one we need to improve our technology and we need to use our resources, whatever they're with us, wisely. Okay, and therefore, in the mitigation approach, conservation and restoration is very important. And using the in using the energy, uh, you know, you know, very wisely, and that is one main mantra of this mitigation approach. So look at the uh, solar power things. You know, solar thermal power and photovoltaic through the nuclear fissions, fusions to wind power, biofuels, and etc. Everything, you know. All these things comes under the uh, mitigation approach. And finally, we have the geoengineering that is the carbon sequestration. Though it is a new area of research and there are a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, technologies slowly and gradually coming, we have to wait, see, wait and watch how this new approach is, is, is uh, becoming more, uh, uh, more, more acceptable for the, for, the, for the scientific world. Now, Three core drivers of the unsustainability, consumption, production, and distribution, which is the main thing that we have to consume. Should, it, we should not consume beyond the limit of it. So we use the resources beyond the reasonable limits set by the natures. We should not overconsume. Second, we have to produce efficiently. And third, we have to distribute equally. So inequality, inequal production, and uh, and, uh, and overconsumption. These three problems leads to unsustainability in this era of uh, uh, Anthropocene. Therefore, what we are trying to achieve through the sustainable development by recognizing Anthropocene, one is intergenerational equity. So what exactly we understand by intergenerational equity, it must be that basic needs of the present and the future generations. So we, the present generation, should take and optimally use all kind of resources that we have and also we have to keep this so that uh, our future generations can also uh, you know use it, the resources sustainably and three major thing that capitals and assets and how you going to use the capital so capital we have various kinds of capital natural capital social capital financial capital human capital natural capital means the natural environment that the uh, you know that we have the social capital that is a human being and its network, okay? And financial capital that is the economic things and the related to the livelihood and economy. And the human capital is the individual one. So all these things, capital assets are very, very important. Uh, and I, we, we have to use uh, the, the capital assets sustainably. So sustainable use of capitals and assets is very important in this era of Anthropocene because we have done enough. And what you are actually, uh, we are talking about, because, and it should be socially desirable, 
because we have to use our uh, resources in such a way that is important for the people's cultural, material, and spiritual needs in an equitable way. Second, the economically viable, so that the cost of the development should not be exceeded uh, the output. And ecologically sustainable, that means that it connotes the maintaining the long-term viability for support the ecosystem. And finally, improve the quality of life, because all of us are looking forward to have a better quality of life better educations, better jobs, okay, and better environment. So respect the rights and freedoms for the promotion of new forms of renewable energy, such as wind, solar, and geothermal power, etc. And narrowing the gaps between the rich and poor is very, because we are living in an unequal world. And this unequal world is because of the, uh, because of the, uh, you know, unsustainable use of the resources. There is a massive conflict different parts of the world, and we are witnessing today. So we have to understand this. Hence, I'm, I'm just uh, uh, sharing this slide because I think all of us should know, and I'm reading with you, and we have to take an oath. The pale blue dot, look at, and look at this picture, and it is written by Carl Sagan. Look again at that dot. There is here, that's the home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you have ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives, the aggregate of our journey, joy and suffering, and uh, thousands of confident religious ideologies and economic doctrines, every hunter and foragers, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilizations, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politicians, every superstar, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on a moat of dust and suspended in a sunbeam. This is where we are today. This is just a dot taken by, the, taken by Voyager 2 and it is where we are. Therefore, I finished my lecture here. We need to recognize Anthropocene. We need to take this res uh, responsibility on ourselves to save the world. So thank you very much. And I'm uh, closing my lecture here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shubhata. And it was very enlightening lecture and magnificent because uh, this was a new topic for us, that Anthropocene, uh, because uh, I have heard about it. We have already heard, but uh, the way you have uh, highlighted uh, the, the journey of this geological age and how your correlation between human uh, impact and the environment, climate change, uh, environmental aspects, that is magnificent because, this, because always we are taking care of the science and technology. But we should know because uh, I was just talking to my director also that uh, when uh, this, uh, I have seen this in UPSC examination. Such a, whatever you have told and such questions and such history, geology, and And I think there are some descriptive questions I also see in there. So thank you, sir. Thank you for your thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you for your address. Now moving to the because you will not be able to take questions from students. Students, sorry, because you are already running of time, but you can uh, uh, post us some questions to email so that uh, to your teachers. Uh, so we will uh, uh, attend those questions and uh, we will send uh, through email and uh, we will try to send us to the respective speakers. So thank you very much. Now moving to the concluding segment. The director and staff of CSI Mary are indeed grateful to the guest speakers for graciously and readily accepting our invitation. It will be a great pleasure for us to listen to them again in our future events. It is true that many efforts have been made to solve environmental problems. But still, environmental challenges are many, and collectively, we need to strive hard to achieve sustainable development. I am sure that this webinar has been into, uh, successful in giving a message in the direction. I owe special gratitude to all participants who have joined us today, including students and teachers and health workers from the Department of uh, Health and Family Welfare, Government of Maharashtra. I sincerely thank our director, Dr. Kubaiji, Director CSI Lee, for guidance and stewardship. Our IT team and my entire team for kind support. Also, thanks to those who are associated in organizing this event. Here we conclude this program. Thanks to one and all. Thank you very much.